Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Ashley Rose and thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you are doing well. And I also hope that you are ready for this emotional roller coaster that is episode four of Blue Eye Samurai. Let's get right into it. So when we last left Mizu and Ringo, they were on their way to find Fowler. When we last left Akimi, she was on her way to find Tygen. And when we last left Tygen, he was unfortunately being kidnapped. So the scene opens with tea being prepared with two drops of something mysterious being placed in the tea by Akimi, who then offers Mizu a drink. My first question, how the hell did these two end up in the same room? So we follow Mizu and Ringo through the town as they're walking and everyone is excited to see this death duel that's happening in the middle of the street. Now, one of the warriors is wearing his hair the way Tigans should be, all shade. And the two of them are in the middle of a stare off. The tension builds. And then in one move, we see confusion on one of the men's faces, which is followed closely by shock as he realizes that he has been cut. His neck begins to squirt blood and he dies right there in the snow. Now, I for one am very glad that things like this no longer happen in the middle of the street because I would be thoroughly traumatized. Just saying. Next. Ringo offers to arrange for a night at an inn, but Mizu says that they are headed to a brothel instead. Now, I was extremely tickled by Ringo's excitement when he received this very exciting news. And here we are once again reminded of Mizu's gender. So Ringo is expressing concern for Mizu because he inquires whether she knows what happens at brothels, what goes down. She refuses to answer and I absolutely crack up. Now, Mizu goes into the brothel and she says she wants to see Madame Kaji, the owner, and she is not interested in seeing anyone else. Madame Kaji is reported to be quite literally booked and busy, but Mizu was willing to wait. I was also very, very amused when Mizu suggested that Ringo leave and his response is, an apprentice must stay with his master. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ringo, that, that's why you want to stay. Yeah, we believe you. Anyway, the time is passing. It's shown by the incense burning. The incense were fresh when they walked in, and now they're burned almost down to the quick, and Mizu and Ringo are still waiting. In the meantime, we watch as the other patrons get their rocks off, and yet another lady is sent to bring Mizu a drink, which she denies. Mizu turns and goes to speak to the receptionist again, and we see a grown woman crawl in front of her because he's playing the role of a naughty child, and a woman who I'm assuming to be his guardian spanks him. Now keep that close, because we revisit this dynamic more than once throughout the season, and the women speak openly about their observations, which I am very entertained by. Meanwhile, Mizu's face watching this interaction absolutely sent me, y'all. I was sent it, and we finally get to meet Madame Kaji, who is giving a motivational speech to what I can only assume is a group of new recruits. So two out of the three seem to have had a great week as evidenced by the fact that they're paid. But the third one, I don't know, it's giving entitled. She had her very ready hand slapped instead of getting her coins, y'all. And after this, Madame Kaji is called outside by the receptionist who watched this interaction through the door and expresses how much he likes it when Madame Kaji disciplines the girls. But Madame Kaji is not here for the flattery, y'all. And she does not care about him getting his rocks off. She is very much giving anyone can get it right now. And she is not meaning that in a good way. She knocks this dish to the ground, breaks it. And then he finally tells her what he wants quickly at that. He tells her Mizu wants to see her. And the irony here, quick side note, is that the receptionist who got the plate knocked out of his hand, he probably liked the violence of this interaction if he liked watching her slap folks around. And it's pretty clear from this moment that in every corner of this brothel slash tea house, someone is having their perfect fantasy lived out in real time. So I would venture to say that business is going very well. And shout out to you, Madam Kaji. And that's genuine flattery. Do not slap me. Anyways, Madame Kaji goes to Mizu and she assumes that Mizu is rejecting the other women there because she wants a man instead, which is a fair assumption. But Mizu shares her awareness that this tea house is known for catering to peculiarities, which roughly translates to quirky and strange behaviors slash preferences. Now, Madame Kaji defends this and she says that anyone can master the 12 and 20 positions, but her girls cater to those who are basically wild at heart and wild in their desires as well. Now, I have a quick side note here. The 12 and 20 positions are later referred to in the episode, so keep that close as we revisit. But for now, the clarity is the 12 positions are the basic normal marriage positions that every wife should know in order to please her husband. But the 20 additional positions are reserved for the freaks. And shout out to them, y'all. So a quick question for all of you. How many of you know 32 sex positions as we speak and can do them all? What? Girl! 
see you, boo. That's impressive. I mean, I don't, but I love to see it and I wish I did. Shout out to you. Anyways, moving on. While Madame Kaji defends these peculiarities, the primary thing that actually brings her into this success in her business is catering to these men who want these interesting things. But Mizu simply criticizes. Now, quick side note here, anyone who goes through life as a judgmental person understands exactly where Mizu is at right now. I mean, the fact of being judgmental, it's simply the ability to make an observation, usually negative, based on how someone or something contradicts the values and principles that we hold dear, right? I will venture to say that there's absolutely nothing wrong with having the ability to make a judgment, the character flaw of being judgmental, however, probably comes from the fact of choosing to say the quiet part out loud, sans filter, sans chaser, and people typically don't enjoy that. Now, Mizu, once again, she says what we're all thinking, truly. She observes this and you know, she sees that these strong men come into these brothels to be weak and to be treated like children, which is a valid point. I too would raise an eyebrow if I saw a grown ass man crawling on the floor, pretending to be a naughty child so he could be spanked by his guardian. And yes, I said guardian because I refuse to acknowledge the fact that he's probably pretending that this is his mother because gross. It's safe to say that I too would have thoughts, okay? That's all I'm saying. The point here is we hear you, Mizu. We hear you. But the reason she comes off as judgmental is because she consistently decides to communicate without a filter. Now, I personally respect it, but Ming, Ringo's little face when Mizu said this had me feeling bad for him just a little bit, you know? It's like, now we know what story he's not gonna share when they go golfing together. But it's okay, Ringo. We know all about the peaches, buddy. We were there and we are genuinely happy for you. Moving on. Madame Kaji shares with Mizu how mastering all of the arts, including the art of sex, would make her a better fighter. And later in the conversation, she challenges Mizu about being only a sword, which is no better than a demon. And she gives this poetic speech about how a swordsman who knows the shape of his soul makes a more capable samurai, which I believe that. I believe that to be true. She then takes Mizu into the pleasure quarters where we all get to peek inside and see the variety of peculiarities offered in these rooms, for example. In one of the rooms, a woman writes on a man's body in a very sensual way. They're both nude, there's candles on the ground, it's giving very romantic. Meanwhile, in another room, a man is tied up BDSM style baby and it's giving straight up kink. And then in another room, we have a good old threesome going on. And listen, tell me how many of you were flabbergasted by what we saw next? You know what I'm talking about. When they showed the threesome scene and then we flashed inside of Mizu's brain and we see her and Tygen in their little chopstick duel from episode three, whose mouth hit the floor? <laughs> yeah, mine too. Okay, I mean, wait a minute. Does Mizu have a secret crush on Tygen? Okay, that's the quiet part we need you to say out loud, baby girl. You can tell us. Don't be shy. Anyways, Madam Kaji brings Mizu into one of the rooms and once again, they are settled in and Madam Kaji asks Mizu to tell her her desire. And then she says, okay, fine. If you can't tell me, then write it. Mizu's ass writes the name Abijah Fowler. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I am certain that this ruined the mood. Now, I'm assuming Madam Kaji thought she had a new little minty on her hands, y'all. Like, let me teach you a lesson, sign, you know? But as soon as she catches Mizu's drift, she's like, oh, oh, no, no, you're not here for that, are you? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Then she proceeds to vaguely share about Fowler's repulsive kinks and the fact that they require a specialist, whatever that means, my goodness. And then... Madam Kaji shares that Abijah is the kind of person who takes pleasure in the pain of others. Now, we've all met one or two people like that, hopefully not too many. We can agree that it's a very sad way to live. But although Madam Kaji seems to agree that Abijah's sexual desires are deplorable, she does not tell Mizu how to get into the castle and kill him because ultimately he is her client. And I'm pretty sure he's a very high paying client. So she stands to leave and we know that the name drop of the day Mizu had that one up her sleeve, and it was none other than Haiji Shindo. Mizu knew that Madam Kaji probably had to have dealt with some sort of inappropriate behavior at the hands of Haiji Shindo. So she mentioned that if Haiji Shindo had violated her in any way, specifically with his right hand, that she had been avenged. Now, we all remember that hand. It was chopped off. It was sent into the abyss. It's somewhere resting in hell or on the side of a mountain. It's unable to grab or fondle anyone else, RIP. But a quick side note here. When Mizu uses her sword to pull the candle out and we watch the smoke rise to punctuate her words and we also see Madame Kaji's reaction to this news, I just want to give another quick shout out to the director, Jane Wu, because it be the visuals for me. Like, that was absolutely beautiful, y'all. That moment is one of my favorite visual moments in this episode. So shout out to you, Jane. You've been doing your big one all season. Moving on. The tables have now turned and Mizu is asking Madame Kaji to name her desire because she provides services too. I thought that was such a sick line. Also, 
Madame Kaji gets to see Mizu play with her sword a little bit right there in the pleasure quarters. I mean, I just love that for both of them. Anyways, they take a walk. And again, we're reminded that Mizu was doing an amazing job as pre- at presenting as a male because Madame Kaji makes this speech and one of the lines is she tells Mizu, men like you have the luxury of revenge, whereas women like me have to be practical. Now, because we know what we know, um, sometimes I do wonder if certain people know that Mizu is female, but are acting like they don't know. But this one, Madam Kaji seems convinced that Mizu is a male. Or maybe not. Who knows? Anyways. Um, so in this conversation, we learn about Boss Hamata. And here's what she shares. So, Boss Hamata basically owns this part of the city. He has a gambling house, not far from the Bravo, but it seems like he owns the entire block. And he and his Thousand Claw army enforce his will and defend his interest. Basically, half of the business profit from the Bravo goes to Hamata, even though he has not spread nary a leg or contributed to anybody's happy ending ever because he is a tyrant. And sometimes he even gets greedier and money simply isn't enough. And it looks like Madam Kaji herself has to service him on demand, which mm, I hate that for you, girl. I really do. Now, Madam Kaji sounds like she's at least willing to accept this arrangement for what it is and stomach it. But more recently, she has a brand new personal grievance. And the story goes like this. So once upon a time, Madam Kaji was sold a girl by the name of Kinuyo, who was deaf and mute and had been habitually abused by her father. Under Madam Kaji's care, Kinuyo learned the art of hospitality and she worked within the brothel and they grew very close. Now, Kinuyo shared with Madam Kaji that she would rather die than be touched by another man. And Madam Kaji protected her from this. She was safe. She was good. She was working in the brothel, not as a sex worker, but, you know, on the hospitality side, probably the receptionist low key. But one day, Hamata came and took Kinuyo away. And he had been keeping her under his watchful eye in the gambling house ever since. And we can only imagine what he's doing to her. Now, Madam Kaji's request caught me by surprise because instead of asking Mizu to kill Hamata, she requests that Mizu kills Kinuyo as an act of mercy to put her out of her misery, which I get it. You know, she shares that if she kills Hamata, it'll be obvious that it was her and the brothel will be attacked in return and she has other girls to protect. So she instructs Mizu to make this look like an accident. And when they return to the pleasure quarters, Madam Kaji gives Mizu a, a signal to sign to Kinuyo before she kills her to put her at ease. Quick side note here, I hope that I'm pronouncing her name right, Kinuyo. Anyways, if I'm not, forgive me. But I did some research to find the meaning of this hand signal, this sign in American Sign Language. And I didn't find anything definitive. As for the hand over the mouth part, I couldn't find anything for that in ASL. However, the two arms over the chest roughly translates to I love you in ASL, roughly. So let's just accept I love you to be the meaning of that with a spoonful of salt, just in case it's way off, the same way I might be way off pronouncing her name. And if anyone knows exactly what it does mean, please be sure to leave that in the comments so that we can all know. Now, anyway, this sign that Madam Kaji gives to Mizu to share with Kinuyo, keep that close. We will revisit. But after this, Mizu sits alone with her thoughts and Akimi comes and knocks on the door and we see the scene from the beginning of the episode where Akimi asked to be let in. And once again, I beg the question, how the hell did Akimi and Mizu end up in the same room? Well, the good news is we don't have to wait long for that answer. So buckle up as we travel back in time to Akimi's castle and her father, Lord Daichi, is coming into the prayer room to check on her. Now, it looks like Akimi has been in there for some days or this is what he's been led to believe because Akimi will not look at her father. She will also not acknowledge that he is in the room because that is in fact not Akimi, which we know, but he does not. And this is the literal equivalent of the child who puts the pillows in the bed to sneak out of the house, except she put a human in the prayer room to sneak out of the town. And Lord Daichi's entire reason for coming to visit Akimi in the prayer room as she sits before the gods is to take the birds and bees conversation to a whole new level by bringing her the 12 and 20 positions so that she can study and practice for her future husband. Now, remember what I said earlier about the 12 positions being the 12 that every respectable wife learns if she aims to please her husband, right? Well, the Shogun son is one of the most powerful, well, first of all, the Shogun is one of the most powerful men in Japan right under the emperor. So you know that the Shogun and his sons have plenty of access to ladies of the night because, you know, that's the kind of activity that comes usually with that level of power. It's safe to say 
that the Shogun son, who Akimi is set to marry, resides among the freaks. And I would say shout out to him, but he, for all we know, he's a tyrant. And we still have no confirmation that his first wife is even still with us. So he gets no shout outs at this time, okay? Moving on. Lord Daichi tells Akimi that she needs to know the other 20 positions as well. And if y'all were wondering if this conversation between Akimi, the gods, and her father could get any more awkward, hold on to your hats, baby, because that ain't even Akimi, which Lord Daichi learns when he tries to turn her around and get her to talk to him. Angrily, of course, he sends his army to find her. And then we check in on Akimi from earlier that day, who's been traveling with Goro. Goro, remember the flesh trader she picked up in the random tavern that she went to when she ran away from Seki after they got into the argument? That's Goro. He is serving as her contract negotiator. His goal is to get her to a brothel and sell her off so that he can make his money and she can find her Tigan, but he doesn't know that part. So she's looking for Tigan and he's looking for a payday. They go town to town to no avail because she has this picture and she's showing people and no one has seen him. And there was this really cool moment when Akimi was back in me on Oseki. And remember the celebration that we saw in episode two, the Haraka Matsuri? Remember how the two people who catch the Shingi sticks are lucky all year and their wishes come true? Now, of course, we know Ringo caught the first one, but Ringo had this brief interaction with this hilariously intense old lady during the Haraka Matsuri. And she basically said, uh-uh, step aside, youngin. That stick is mine because I'm getting me a husband this year or something like that, right? Well, we know Ringo got the first one because he came up out of the water with it in his mouth but guess who got the second one damn right baby so akimi shows her the picture and she's like nope i haven't seen him and then she turns and she's like husband how about you <laughs> and i was like oh hell yeah she got her man i love that for her that made me so happy moving on akimi does not know that tygen has been kidnapped at this point and she doesn't know that she's not going to find him but she does see her father's army in the distance and she tells Goro that they need to go in the opposite direction to continue to looking for brothels to sell her to. So for the first time this episode, we finally get to check in on Tygen and y'all, he is in very bad shape. Like I genuinely feel bad for him. And as I figured, he is being tortured mercilessly by Haiji Shindo because he is mad about his hand. And while Abijah watches, he... Tigan, like a champ, refuses to tell them anything about Mizu. I mean, he grows more likable by the minute, I just have to say. And also, Haiji Shindo reminds Tigan why he should hate Mizu, you know, and want to betray her, obviously, for the humiliation, the canceled marriage, the missing hair. But Tigan is not swayed, and true to form, he gives us a sassy comeback, which is one of the traits that we know him for, and we're slowly starting to love him for, except when it's directed at Mizu. And Mizu is not getting betrayed by Tygen at any point anytime soon. And I just love this. So I do hope Tygen gets out of this situation. I'm not gonna lie, he's in a bit of a pickle and I genuinely hate that for him and I hope he gets out of there soon. So Abijah grows bored with this torture session. I don't know, I guess he's seen better. And we follow him to the chapel where he proceeds to tell the Lord that he has no real regard for him. I mean, they're not homies, but maybe they can help each other out. Abijah shares his plans with the Lord, which are to kill the Shogun and reimagine Japan to fit his own preferences. And he promises that if all goes well, according to him, he will turn Japan religious. Now, it is unclear what religion he's referring to, be that Christianity, Catholicism, any of the others. I'm not certain, but I did do some research because my curiosity got the best of me. And I learned that Christianity was prohibited in Japan during the Edo period, which is the current setting of Mizu's story. This was until about 1873 that Christians were not only persecuted, but prosecuted for their faith. So quick tidbit there. I also got more curious and did some digging. And it turns out that the two main faiths of Japan as of today are Shinto and Buddhism. I was curious because I was like, wait, so when Japan was westernized, as we know, happened, you know, around the 1800s, when they were westernized, did they go Christian? Did they go Catholic? I'm sure there are some out there, but the primary faiths in Japan today are Shinto and Buddhism. And this here is a bit of lovely tea that I really appreciated. So the practice of religion in Japan is way more eclectic than that of Western culture. Like rather Rather than identifying themselves as belonging to a, a religion or deity, Japanese citizens practice spirituality and worship in a way that has more to do with well-being and worldly benefits rather than doctrines, beliefs, and rules. So religious identification is a bit of a foreign notion in Japanese culture. The vast majority of Japanese citizens do follow Shinto, but only about 3% identify as Shinto. They basically reject the extremism of religious movements. So it sounds like as a whole, they refer to keep things simple. They typically refer to themselves as spiritual rather than religious. And honestly, I love that for them. However, I do see how colonizers could come to Japan, experience them as a nation that's quote unquote lacking in religion and seek to indoctrinate them instead of just allowing them to be themselves because I mean, that's what colonizers do. So 
Abijah concludes his speech by saying that he has no need for human souls. Therefore, the souls he collects in his coup are the Lord's for the taking. And then he makes his exit. And I need you guys to do me a very quick favor. Clap it up for that spider who played her cards right and didn't get squished. Charlotte, we see you. Meanwhile, Goro is thoroughly exhausted by Akemi's selectiveness at this point. They have gone town after town after town. And Goro is straight up whisper screaming in his little rant. And he reveals that he would drop a sleeping potion into another girl's drink and they would wake up in a brothel and he would be off with his money. And he doesn't know why he hasn't done that to Akimi yet. For whatever reason, he has been practicing restraint. Now, I personally think that this is what it truly means to be protected by the gods, which Akimi obviously is, even though that wasn't you praying in the prayer room, girl. But have you ever found yourself in a situation that's supposed to be dangerous with people who are obviously dangerous and yet somehow you're perfectly safe? Hopefully not too often and hopefully not on purpose because... No, but like that's what it means to be just divinely protected, I feel. And then Kimmy ever so charmingly overhears Goro because how could she not? He's whisper screaming. And she gracefully apologizes for being difficult because that's what a princess does. And during this conversation, two kids pass by. They're excited about this upcoming death duel happening in the streets. The same one from the beginning of the episode. And then Goro and Akimi attend the death duel. Akimi spots Mizu. She's wearing Tigan's scarf. And Akimi follows Mizu and Ringo to Madame Kaji's brothel. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the two of these women end up in the same place. So, Akimi and Goro go inside the brothel. And apparently, Goro is not welcome around these parts. So, here's the tea. Goro's last girl that he brought was not ideal and madam kaji was not happy they even described her as a poxy puss which do i even want to know what that means i do i do leave it in the comments however akimi's beauty does convince madam kaji to check her out and with one look madam kaji knows that akimi is not just a princess act honey she is the real thing so she gives her one night to addition she brings her into the room with the other working girls and she instructs akimi to eat or be eaten which Solid advice considering the environment, you know? And Akimi eats, baby. Our girl shows out on her first night as a working girl, and she didn't even have to bust that thing open. So let's get into how that went down. Now, remember the name Issei, okay? You've all met an Issei. You all know an Issei. She is your average jealous girly, and we avoid her like the plague. Now, when Akimi tries to focus on the mission and get paired with the blue-eyed freak, as Mizu is described, she instead is paired with Watari the walrus as requested by Issei. As made obvious by the name, Watari the walrus is a bit on the heavier side and for some reason or another he's had a bit of a hard time getting it up lately which presents a special challenge to Akimi and Akimi is instructed to make Watari rise and fall while the other girls watch. So here we go. Akimi goes into the pleasure quarters and goes into the room and she begins her time with Watari by being very accommodating, very polite. She's offering sake by the cup. She continues to refill when he drinks it. And then Watari grabs the entire pitcher and drinks the whole thing. Watari instructs Akemi to remove her kimono, and then he instructs her to come closer. She narrowly avoids both commands with charm and flattery. Watari eventually reveals to Akemi that he has a love for the arts, and immediately she is in her wheelhouse. She recites a poem by Ono no Kamachi. And of course, I had to do some research on this poet because it's me. And here's what I found. Ono no Kamachi is one of the six best poets of the early Heian period. She also ranked as one of the greatest erotic poets in any language, which shout out to you, girl. Side note, Ono no Kamachi was so renowned for her beauty that to this day, the word Kamachi is synonymous with feminine beauty in Japan. Now, how's that for a legacy? We love to see it. Now, the short, sweet poem that Akimi recites by Ono no Kamachi was called I Long For Him. And wouldn't you believe it, Watari and his longtime no-see little homie shows up to the party, y'all. Shows up to the party. And Watari, horny and all, tries to kiss Akimi, who cleverly suggests that they recite Renga poetry next, because you know what that means. He has to participate by using his mouth to do something other than kiss her. So, Renga. What is that? That's a genre of Japanese collaborative poetry in which two poets alternate reciting stanzas back and forth. And as each poet contributes their brushstroke, it goes like this. The first poet recites three lines of 17 syllables. And then the second poet recites two lines of 14 syllables. And then they rinse and repeat until the poem is over. So Akimi tells a very eager Watari to recite the first stanza, like you go first, and she'll respond with a couplet. Now, during the back and forth, Watari tries again to kiss Akemi because, again, his longtime no-see little homie is around and he is ready to party. And Akemi is quick on her feet. She stands up. She delivers her couplet with authority and grace. And she commands Watari to show her 
his brush stroke, which he does. They continue the poetry pattern and Watari strokes his brush until he gives some sweet, sweet nectar from his body, which Akemi respectfully declines and leaves the room. Now, remember when I said Akemi might have some tricks up her sleeve and maybe I shouldn't be so worried for her? It turns out she did. And that was one of them. And she's applauded in the hallway by the other girlies. And she's informed what she wants to finally know is if Blue Eyes is still refusing to be serviced by any of them. He is. So Akemi takes the teapot and she says she's going to be the one to get Mizu to accept her services. You go, girl. Now, Remember that bottle of sleeping potion that girl shadily said that he uses on the other girls, but he has not used on Akemi? She stole that from him at some point, which thank God, because he was not doing the Lord's work with it. And she drops two drops of that into Mizu's sake, which I thought was tea at first, but it's actually sake. And she goes into the room. Now, right away, Akemi notices Mizu's eyes and says that they're beautiful. And then she goes on to say that they remind her of the sky and the sea. And Mizu accepts her drinks and then casually calls her out for the flattery overkill, which I found hilarious. And then they share a moment. And Akemi mentions that this kind of thing actually works on the other men. And it's in this exact moment that I realize that I have a personal conflict of interest here. Actually, it's two things. So if Mizu likes Tigan secretly, we are absolutely looking at a love triangle situation forming here. And as much as I think that Mizu could benefit from having more love in her life, this could get very messy very quickly. So the thing is, as much as Tygen is growing on me, Big Homie is not worth these two fabulous babes fighting over him because nah, like nah, I don't want to see that. They deserve better, you know? And I could very well see Mizu and Akemi as friends and partners in a shared mission. Like, think about it. Akemi wants to find Tigan. Tigan has been kidnapped. He's currently being held hostage by the man Mizu wants to kill, Abijah. They don't know that, but we do. And this makes way more sense for the two of them to be on the same side. But as it were, Akemi has drugged Mizu sake, and now all we can do is hope she doesn't drink it because she's got a job to do tonight. When Mizu notices that the drink is not tea, but sake instead, she mentions it. She mentions that she doesn't drink. Akemi offers an excuse. She offers Akemi a cup. Akemi hesitates to drink as well because, of course. And then Mizu notices that the drink is hot, which Akemi explains that in Kyoto, where she's from, the men prefer hot sake. Now, Mizu has all the information and I would assume confirmation that she needs. Mizu then proceeds to do something we have never seen her do before, y'all. She begins to overshare. I mean, overshare, straight up Ringo style. It's giving like she sat at the feet of the master himself. She brings up Tigan. She talks about cutting off his chignon. She talks about ruining his engagement. And then he chased her down and challenged her to a rematch. And then she killed him. We know that she embellished that last part, but Akemi doesn't. And she loses it. And they get into a scuffle. Now, was anyone else amused when the girls in the other room all hear this noise? And one of them is like, oh, she's good. <laughs> Me too, y'all, because on what planet does it sound like anybody is having a good time making that much noise? I mean, it clearly sounds like something is not okay on the other side of that wall, but they're sitting over there like, mm, go off, queen, which cracked me up, honestly. Now, Mizu pins Akimi to the floor and tells her that she did, in fact, not kill Tygen, but she does want to know why Akimi came all of this way to save what she calls a doomed engagement, when obviously Akimi is in a position to have way better options. Akemi admits that she is set to marry the Shogun's son. And of course, we know this already. This is the most powerful alliance that can possibly be secured for Akemi. But in her defense, we don't know what kind of man he is. And she's justified in being concerned. So Mizu reminds her that women typically do not have any good options. And due to her being high born, she can literally have whatever she wants. And here she is chasing after trash, a.k.a. Tygen, which <laughs> true, but rude. I mean, eh. anyway. Akemi tries to attack Mizu again, and she ends up tied in ropes very much like Ringo in episode one, minus the tree. So speaking of Ringo, who has been doing what this entire time? Do we even want to know? Ringo, have you been playing with the peaches again? No judgment, buddy. It just Mizu's going to judge you, but we won't. Anyways, Mizu puts Ringo in charge of watching over Akemi while she goes to complete her mission. Mizu instructs Ringo to kill Akemi if she screams or moves. Ringo is hesitant, but the face he makes when he is trying to be intimidating absolutely sent me. Like, it was way more adorable than scary, but you know what? A for effort, Ringo. And then when Mizu leaves, he relaxes his face, smiles, and then apologizes for staring. At this point, y'all, I'm just hoping that Kimmy doesn't try to escape because I am thoroughly convinced that Ringo would help her just to make sure she doesn't hurt herself with the ropes. Listen, meanwhile... Akemi sets out on her mission to mercy kill Kinuyo and is instructed by Madame Kaji um, what to do and how to get inside. 
The doctor comes in every night to treat Kinuyo for the sores that she's been given by Hamata. And this is the one time that Kinuyo is not under Hamata's direct supervision. So Mizu makes her way to the top of the gambling house, Mizu style, by leaping from building to building, narrowly avoiding being seen by some of the guards, and then she crawls around until she finds Kinuyo's room and she's receiving moxibustion therapy treatment. Now, I did some research because what even is that? Moxibustion therapy is performed by the burning of mugwort leaves, which is a small spongy herb, and this is believed to enhance healing, especially when it's accompanied by acupuncture. So it stems from Chinese medicine. Its purpose is to strengthen the blood, stimulate the, form, the flow of energy, maintain good health, and alleviate chronic pain. So while this therapy is happening, Mizu is hiding in the ceiling, and a bird flies down at the exact moment when the guards are just below Mizu. And Mizu kills the bird and then catches it in her hand to avoid being spotted. Now listen, I understand her reasoning for sure. But I do have to say, I was not prepared for this very symbolic moment. I mean, at this point, we are very much used to Mizu's accuracy with her sword, but this poor bird, you know? And Mizu herself seems to mourn for just a moment before she carefully places the bird back into the nest where we then see four unhatched eggs. Oh, hate that. Mizu moves on to Kinuyo's room where the doctor is now gone and Kinuyo is resting after her treatment while the guard stands by sleepily. Mizu kills the guard, which wakes up Kinuyo. Mizu gives her the signal from Madam Kaji, and the first time she does this, Kinuyo pulls back. Mizu does the signal again, and this time Kinuyo returns the signal with a shake of her head, essentially rejecting it. And this is a loaded moment, and we all need to know what the hell it means. Even Mizu seems confused, but a guard is coming, so Mizu reaches out her hand and says, I'll protect you, to Kinuyo, who hesitates, but then takes her hand. Now, I must say that even though we know that Mizu will stop at nothing for her revenge, I genuinely thought that maybe Mizu suspected that there was more to the story. Maybe Madam Kaji didn't reveal everything. Maybe Kinuyo was not suffering the way we were led to believe and possibly was not as miserable as Madam Kaji assumed. In doing some digging, I learned that having a physician come and attend to her every single day would have been an expensive luxury in the Edo period. And yes, Boss Hamata was a brute for sure, but what if he took really good care of her? And what if Kinuyo didn't hate her life after all? What if Kinuyo was pregnant and had a baby to live for, thus the symbolism of the unhatched eggs and the slain mother bird? We'll never know. What we do know for sure is that Kinuyo did not want to die. So when she breathed that sigh of relief after the guard passed by and she leaned her head on Mizu all trustingly, I also let out a sigh. But when Mizu pulled her close and then snapped her neck, y'all, I was in absolute shock. I was genuinely shocked and appalled. Like we know Mizu is not above murder. We know that. I just, I wasn't expecting that. And what was even more shocking was the moment when Mizu took a moment to stop and mourn Kinuyo and possibly the mother bird with the four unhatched eggs as well. It's like in less than five minutes, she just killed two innocent creatures. And I believe that this was the moment when for even for Misu, she realized that maybe in her quest for revenge, she'd gone just a little too far. See, Madam Kaji had a right to want to keep her promise to Kinuyo and offer the mercy kill, but the offer was clearly rejected. And although Kinuyo had not chosen death for herself, Madam Kaji, with the help of Misu, had chosen death for her. And I believe that Mizu was truly shaken. And for the first time we see in this whole season, a side of her that is very much human and is very much aware of the value of human life and how much it takes from you to take that life at will. It's possible that despite her best efforts, Mizu is not the cold-blooded killer that even she thinks she is. It's possible. But as instructed, Mizu carefully arranges the scene to make it look like an accident or make it look like an altercation. And she gives Kinuyo one more sweet touch on her arm, almost like an apology. And she clears out. When Mizu leaves the gambling house, she takes a moment outside to gather herself. She's clearly panicked, as evidenced by the fact that her hand won't stop shaking violently. Her breathing is unregulated. And she does something that she doesn't do. She doesn't notice that someone is walking up on her. Someone walks up and sees her. And instead of a guard, thankfully, it's a little boy. And just like with the bird, Mizu could eliminate the obstacle within 0.2 seconds and be free and clear. Instead, she sits there, hand on her blade, for eight entire seconds. Yes, I counted. But instead of eliminating the obstacle, Mizu instructed the boy to find the guards and tell them that there's been an altercation and that two people are dead. Now, remember how all throughout the season thus far, Mizu's being called a demon and an onryo and a devil? We've seen some actual demons on this show. I mean, Hachiman, the flesh trader, 
blood-soaked chaiki, bruh. And even Boss Hamata is described by Madam Kaji as someone who enjoys breaking delicate things. Ugh, gross. In this moment, though, it's evident that Misu is not truly a demon. I think she feels it would benefit her if she was. I mean, because then she could focus on her revenge and not have to battle her conscience along the way. But Swordfather taught her well. And let's just keep these ponderings close for now, because we will be revisiting them later in the season, for sure. Now, Mizu returns to Madame Kaji, who asks if Mizu showed Kinuyo the sign, and she nods. When she asks what Kinuyo said back, Mizu simply says she understood. Having confirmed that she had completed the mission, Madame Kaji tells Mizu how to get inside of Abijah's castle, and then she mourns for Kinuyo as Mizu walks away. Now, we're back in the room with Ringo, Mizu, and Akimi, who is angrily talking her shit. She also mentions what we have all clearly observed in that Mizu, what she says to her exactly is, under your mask, you are not the killer you pretend to be. And I gotta say, truthfully, I agree. Now, Mizu cuts her free, tells her to leave, which she doesn't. And once again, I am left to my wishful thinking about Mizu and Akemi teaming up to kill Abijah and save Taigen because we don't even have a chance to explore the thought. A scream is heard and Mizu comes outside to see Hamata and his thousand claw army outside of the brothel doors. And the little boy from earlier is brought forth who points out Mizu, that snotty little snitch. And Hamata kills the receptionist and instructs his army to kill everyone inside the brothel and then burn the place down. And then we have to wait until episode five to find out what happens next. I know y'all hate it when I do that, but that's what they be doing to us. So as we hang off the side of this cliff together, waiting with bated breath, let's chat about some final thoughts. Number one, Abijah is a cookie cutter colonist and I've got no love for him, but I do assume that he is simply a product of his trauma and his programming. Madam Kaji is a baddie, y'all. I don't care. I don't care. She is a bit prickly, but she is in a tough industry and she has to be. I mean, she's made her way as a businesswoman in the 1700s. What? In a town or in a, in a country with very limited options for women. And yet she seems to really care about these girls deep down. She don't show it, but she does and you can tell. And she's teaching them to make this money and don't let this money make you. And if you're going to be a madam, I mean, if you absolutely have to be a madam, at least be a madam that gives a fuck. I love that for her. I love that for the girls. Moving on. Can someone, anyone, please somebody go save Tygen? That torture routine is so intense and I do not think he can survive much more of that. Somebody please go save him. Now, Akimi, our favorite spoiled girly, Akimi is the goat, okay? She gets MVP for this episode. The way she handled herself with, with Watari the walrus and even with the other girls in the brothel, she was so brave. She was so confident. She was so focused. She stayed on the mission. She got to Mizu. But Mizu didn't fall for her act job. She really didn't. And honestly, like I said, I would rather see the two of these women working together rather than against each other. And also, please do not fight over Tygen. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to call him trash, but both of y'all can do better than his little arrogant, bald-headed ass. And that is just on period, y'all. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Now, for Mizu, your secret is out, beloved. Mizu is not as heartless as she would like to believe herself to be. I'm sure she hates that, but... We got to admit, we love that for her. We do. And with that being said, that is all for today's episode. We have four more roller coaster rides to go for season one. And I can't wait to hear your thoughts in the comment below about episode four of Blue Eyed Samurai. What was your first impression? How did you feel about the character so far? Did you also scream at that little boy when he snitched on Misu? Like, why, bro? You had one job. Be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. Hit that like button, subscribe, click the notification bell so that you can be among the first to know as soon as episode five drops. Thank you again for joining me here today. And until next time, take care, go be great, and I'll see you soon. Bye.